Oh, thank you, Allison. I appreciate that introduction and framing for our conversation today. Um, I'm grateful for everybody that can participate with us. As I'll just echo what Allison was saying in terms of um, regardless of what your thoughts are right now is sort of an anxious time for most of the folks in our states. And so we want to be here for one another. And we really want to have a conversation about a tender topic. And today we brought together, I think, a panel of experts who bring the topic forward um, through a curious mind and really an open heart. It, in, it's a difficult topic and it's so important. So I'm really excited to be able to welcome um, our, our people and what we'll do is have each person introduce themselves. Um, and I'm assuming since you signed up for the this, this uh, Better Normal call, you did get to read bios. Um, so we could put a copy of that in the chat in case you want to reference it, then we can keep the introductions a little bit more brief. Um, not too brief, but a little bit more brief. Um, what you'll notice is we did not include Arnoff in the bios, so we're going to ask him to be a little bit more descriptive, and I think um, you'll find that, we, uh, that he's really going to enrich our conversation in ways that we might not have expected. So with that, I want to thank each of you for being here. And I'm going to turn it over to Michael and ask him to introduce himself, maybe do some framing, provide some background, and then he'll do a handoff to the next person. And we'd like to have the last person be Arnoff, and he has some slides he'll show us that will help us understand his role, his interest, and his activities. Thank you. Go ahead, Michael. Hello, my name is Michael Polacek. I'm a nurse, and I'm, uh, I'm very passionate about suicide prevention. I'm on the board of directors for the Oregon chapter, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And I've been working in the community for suicide prevention uh, interventions, but I'm also interested in how do we create a community that's trauma-informed and how can we expand all the partnerships within that community so it's a connected community, so all our efforts are in one direction. And uh, I think what I'll do is uh, let Dr. Chandra Geary introduce himself. Oh, one more thing. We're going to be talking about suicide. So it is a sensitive topic. Uh, if anybody feels activated or you feel like you're, you're responding to this and you need to talk with somebody, uh, I think Allison is going to be monitoring the chat. So you can uh, mention that in there as well as Dr. Chandra Geary. Do you still have your phone up? There's a phone number. He's going to... Uh, Put it up in your screen there. If you do need to call somebody directly. Uh, there we go. When he, when he introduces himself, he can do that as well. There we go. Dr. Chandagiri. <laughs> well, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Allison. And, and thanks, Michael. My name is Satya Chandagiri. I'm calling, uh, joining you all from Salem, Oregon. Uh, I'm a, a, an immigrant parent of two children who are now in college, originally from India. And, uh, you know, 32 years I've been practicing psychiatry in three countries. This is the third country I'm practicing. And uh, life has taken us and brought us to this country in 1996. I ended up in uh, Philadelphia, Temple University. And uh, prior to that, for two years, I was serving an island country, St. Lucia, for two years. I was called, half of the country was mine, the 60,000 population. So I got a, that was the first time I got to serve someone who looked different. Uh, so, you know, you can imagine us growing up and you kind of don't, have never seen a black person, a white person. I mean, we thought all of them are tourists. So that's how our brain kind of forms what we today know as uh, our own assumptions and implicit bias, and then having to work in a cross-cultural setting. And I've been serving the state of Oregon for 20 years. I served in all levels of care except prison. And currently I work with a different ends of from age 12 to 100. So over the time I've got to work in different locations, ran a state hospital, I was involved in a county which was taken over for 41 days with some militia, and that caused its own set of challenges when a community-wide violence or, or trauma happens. Mm -hmm. 
So that kind of gave me a first-hand experience of working in a community level. It's the fourth largest county in the country and largest in our state. And so that, plus trying to work in different settings where worked on trauma-informed against seclusion, restraint, suicide, violence, community violence. And now, in addition to practicing psychiatry, I'm also the school board director and chair of uh, our second largest school district, serving 49,000 lives and uh, students plus faculty. In a very historic time, very, very historic time, we are sitting on back to back, I call it a quadruple disasters. And so that is where I find myself. In the history of our Salem Kaiser School District, this is perhaps the first time a person of color became the chair of the school board. So that is really, it brings in a unique uh, opportunities and challenges. So, you know, I just said, as we are dealing with some of these very complex issues in our lifetime, these are, it really raises a lot of profound questions and there is no simple fully formed answers. But it, one thing is very clear, it has kind of affected every level of our community, every level. And so keeping that open mind connecting with people and some of the dynamics that we saw, I would like to highlight in this presentation, perhaps at a, a, what I call my macro level because of the vantage position I have as a school board director and others will probably fill in at a much more program level or individual level. So that's where I really wanted to, for the sake of today's discussion, say, how do we look at the entire community when the community itself is going, it's like a Titanic sinking and you know, doesn't matter if you're in the upper deck or lower deck, everybody is affected. So how do you look at community-wide trauma? What are some of the dynamics that we witnessed and what the, I have un, observed? And then how do you design support? Is where I would like to, if possible, focus my discussion rather than going into individual clinical level for the sake of today's meeting. Thank you. With that, I really want to welcome Bonnie O'Haran and our school uh, nurse, and she has extensive experience. So Bonnie, go ahead. Thank you, welcome. Thank you and welcome. And uh, I am a school nurse here in Salem, Oregon. And um, I kind of got more involved in this through Michael, who his enthusiasm has overflown uh, into my direction. And um, as far as suicide goes, um, small pieces throughout my life, you know, after 60 some years of living here and earth, you kind of run into um, different situations and not knowing really how to handle it or the proper way to handle it. So I am very appreciative of this um, new format of ACEs and trauma-informed care. I have worked with elementary students and just recently with high school students. And I see this, um, with all age groups, all social economical groups, all uh, races, uh, you know, different cultures, they um, all are impacted with difficult problems and uh, dealing with uh, their feelings and suicide. So uh, thank you. And I pass this over to Denise. Hi, um, my name's Denise. I'm also coming from you to you to join you from Salem, Oregon, where I am a school nurse at South Salem High School. I've been here for four years after uh, 20 years in hospital pediatric clinical work and a few years at Liberty House, which is a child abuse assessment center here in Salem, um, where I was really uh, immersed in the culture of uh, ACEs and trauma sensitivity and just super impassioned by what I learned from the staff there about how to interact with human beings who have been through multiple different traumas. And so as I navigated and transitioned into this role in school health, uh, which was just completely overwhelming, I see this just incredibly valuable frontline touch point that we as school nurses have. Um, but yet, so as we all can appreciate so many barriers in connecting um, all the different silos. So I'm just super happy to be connected to this community and have this ongoing 
conversation uh, to, to brainstorm and dream and um, activate some of the ways that we can take this siloed work that we do and impact the holistic health and mental health, um, the whole well being of our kids. Thank you, Denise. I'm super grateful to meet you via uh, Zoom here today, and I look forward to our ongoing conversation. Um, next, we want to ask um, Arnoff to maybe do an introduction, share his insights, and what brings him to this conversation today. Thank you. Hi, I'm Arnav Mohindra. I'm a junior at South Salem High School in Salem, Oregon. And I'm so excited to be here. Um, I'm here as the president of a student-led nonprofit organization in Salem, Oregon uh, called Live to Tell. And our kind of goal is to advocate for students at the policy level while also making sure that resources for mental illness and suicide, are, suicide prevention are available to students, parents, and teachers around the district. And uh, just to make sure that those voices are heard and that uh, we can make sure that those resources are extended um, to all those people and that we are able to support all of those people and make sure that we are doing things that are actually helpful to the community. Because a lot of times uh, policymakers are well-meaning, but um, they don't know what students really need. And that's where we come in. We want to provide that insight and that perspective that policymakers might be missing. Um, should I, should I share my slides right now? Is this- Sure, um, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah. So Arnav has a slide deck that he'll share with us that will kind of give us a better understanding of his organized organization, Live to Tell. It's doing really important work. And I think that will help be part of a springboard for our conversation after we finish kind of doing these introductions. So thank you. Okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, I'm the president of a nonprofit organization called Live to Tell. Um, I just wanted to start by going over where we're at. We're at the Salem, Oregon, um, we're in the Salem, Oregon community, and we are working with the Salem-Kaiser School District, which includes the cities of Salem, Oregon, and Kaiser. Um, we have members from high schools around the district, which our goal is to represent all the different schools from the district in our company so that we can get that perspective from all the different communities and also be able to expand our resources and anything that we come up with to those schools. Um, we've been a part of this community for about a year. It was started by a then senior who has now graduated and was handed off to me at the beginning of this year. Um, I'll just go over how we became a company. Um, it was started by a student at South Salem High School named Eric Martz and his vision was to end the stigma around mental health and suicide um, to make suicide something that we could talk about and to extend resources to people around the district and just kind of make a better environment for students in the community. Um, Eric then took that vision and he reached out to a few students around the district, including myself, to form our initial board of directors. And that included him as president, uh, me as a uh, treasurer, I was the treasurer last year, and uh, Eddie Binford Ross as our, another student at South, as our secretary. Uh, we then expanded from there and uh, expanded our board to include about 15 people from other parts of the district um, so that we can get that input from other schools. And we've also been able to become a part of our community through support from officials, um, such as Dr. S uh, Dr. Satya Chandragiri, who's here today, um, you've heard him speak already, as well as um, the principals from all of our schools and counselors and just all of those people who have been help helping us become a part of that community and achieve our goals. Um, our company is kind of structured um, with a board of directors at the center with a few leadership positions within that board. Um, I myself am president this year. Um, we also have a vice president and we have a secretary and a treasurer and the rest of the people on the board are there to provide their, um, their insi insight from their schools. Um, we also have some involvement with state level uh, groups. The president, of our company has a seat on the Oregon Alliance to Prevent Suicide, as well as the group called Yeah, And both of these groups work to prevent suicide around the community, um, around the state, as well as uh, YAS focuses specifically on um, children and youth. And that is, um, I'm, I currently have a seat on both of those organizations. And we also have chapters at the school level um, around, in schools around the district. Um, Saxon Strong is 
our chapter at South Salem High School and I'm the co-president of that as well. And we kind of use those chapters to be our eyes and ears on the ground to see how each of those schools are doing and also to push out all of our resources um, and that kind of thing. Our mission as it's defined on our website is through advocacy, awareness and education, we work to destigmatize the issue of mental health within the student body and to lead the conversation surrounding suicide prevention and mental wellness. And that kind of divides into three main strands. The first thing we really wanna focus on um, is the ad advocacy at the policy level. As I mentioned earlier, uh, policymakers often wanna help students, but their uh, attempts often do not have the perspective that comes from children and people who are seeing their peers go through this or maybe going through, them, going through this themselves. And that's where we come in. We want to advocate whenever decisions like that are being made, both at the school level and the, the um, legislative level. Uh, we also want to provide resources to students who might be going through um, mental, mental crisis, mental health crisis, or um, resources to teachers who might be seeing students going through that and parents as well. And we also want to reduce the stigma around this topic because nothing will improve unless we can have this conversation out in the open and address this straight on. And that's um, part of where the stigma comes in. Um, the current projects we're working on right now, we've just started working on these projects and are just in the first stages of doing this. Um, right now, our two projects are a resource booklet and a COVID-19 packet. Um, the resource booklet um, is a, a booklet, as, it, as I said, which will be geared towards teachers, students, and parents around the district and will include resources that um, teachers and parents can give to the students or students can use themselves or give to their peers when they might be in a time of crisis. We also wanna include information about how someone can tell when a warning sign is that, like when someone is going through a mental health crisis or maybe thinking about suicide and what someone should do in that scenario and who they can refer them to. And finally, we wanna include testimonies from students, parents and teachers around the district who have dealt with this or have seen someone deal with this, um, just so that students reading this can feel like they're not alone and they can see that there are people who go through this as well. And they can see how other people have dealt with it and that will kind of serve to decrease the stigma because they can see just how widespread this issue is. Um, and the COVID-19 packet is a much briefer, um, briefer project. We wanna just make that uh, one flyer that we can get like one or two pages that we can distribute around the community. And that's focusing on the relationship between mental and physical health and how one can uh, maintain both of those. It's specifically in relation to the stresses related to COVID-19, because as we know, this is a really difficult time. People are not able to see their peers. Uh, people aren't able to see their support networks. And that's why we wanna focus on those stressors as well as uh, resources specifically for that with COVID-19. And uh, this is just self-help, how students can help themselves during this time and how they can help others. Uh, I just wanna kind of end by emphasizing why our organization is important and why we think that we are a vital part of the community. There are a variety, like numerous resources, uh, quite the myriad of resources available in our community, but a lot of them are spread apart. There's no central place where students can go to access them. You may hear different resources, but you don't know how they're accessible. Um, and that's why we kind of want to consolidate those and make them available to all of our students in a way that they can, that's easy to read and easy to use, and they can just see everything in one spot. And again, as I mentioned, the advocacy is extremely important because policies affect everyone and policies need to be well informed and take into account the perspective of students. And finally, as I mentioned, the stigma uh, prevents discussions from being had about this, about this issue and we cannot improve our environment until that stigma is taken care of. And that's why we believe that students taking the lead on this is extremely important because it'll work to improve all of these aspects. That's all I had on our, um, on our company. So that's why I'm, I'm here just to bring that student voice um, and just make you guys aware that our company exists. So Thank you, Arnav. This is really great. Um, I appreciate each of you, the descriptions of your work in the lens that you bring. And I'd like to see if we can maybe open this conversation and have a dialogue, sort of like um, bring our curiosity, bring our heart, bring our, our heads into a conversation where we can really think through the impacts, the resources, um, and everything related to suicide awareness, suicide prevention, recovery, 
in all the different aspects across the continuum. Um, if you'd like to have any questions to ask our guests, please feel free to write them in the chat. Allison will monitor those. Um, but right now, if we could, I'd really like to ask um, to kind of scaffold on what Arnav was talking about in terms of uh, school setting and youth, kind of learn maybe if Bonnie could share with us a little bit about some of the practices that she finds useful in terms of um, stress reduction, kind of more of the upstream prevention ideas. Just just touch on it briefly. I think it, it's an important construct within this whole conversation, if you don't mind. Yeah, no. Um, I find uh, for myself and others, sometimes just getting into the mindfulness, uh, some yoga uh, practices, um, that kind of, if you practice uh, meditation along with your yoga, and I know it's hard for young people to maybe grasp this, but it's just another way of uh, relaxing the mind, rethinking things after you've gone through some uh, periods of meditation or uh, exercise to revisit um, the situation or your feelings, and maybe even open up the fact that, oh, I do know somebody else I could talk to at this time when I'm feeling low or down. Um, I would love to be that person to help them at the school setting, um, but just offering them that or trying to maybe even work with uh, Arnav about that, adding that to his uh, little, you know, pamphlet as another resource for students to um, look at mm -hmm. is the mindful and the yoga and the meditation. Thank you, Bonnie. And what I really appreciate about those ideas is they're so accessible. Even right now during COVID, when we're all experiencing a degree of social isolation, we can find those resources pretty readily available online. And as we're having right now, a virtual connection. You can have a type of virtual connection that might not be what you've experienced before pre-COVID, but it can still have a meaningful um, connection nonetheless. Yeah, at first I was feeling very isolated because I live alone and I got in touch with my nephew in Chicago and he's a yoga instructor. So he set me up with his virtual yoga class on Sundays and I felt so much better even just the fact of seeing people I don't know but we're all doing the same thing and just yeah so I think that that's a really good idea also. Mm -hmm. Yeah I think um, I think um, we'll hear more about the importance as a buffer that social connectedness is. Um, Dr. Um, Chandria Chandra Giri, would you like to talk a little bit about that and maybe infuse the lens of your work at the school and sort of some bringing that community lens or whichever direction you feel feels most appropriate? Thank yeah, you. I, I think uh, starting with Arnav, then having Bonnie describe, you know, one of the biggest thing we all can get lost when such back-to-back -back disaster hits us is a couple of things. We can all fall apart. And the, it really takes a hit on what I call the attachment that we human beings have, you know, whether it's a dist distance learning, social isolation. So that is one thing. And listening to the same thread that Arnav described, Bonnie described, the connectedness, whether with school or another individual, is a very important concept. It's an internal concept that I feel that there is somebody who cares for me. That little concept is life-saving when students or children or adults feel the loss of connectedness, it is dangerous, it's lethal, suicide goes up, all kinds of trauma goes up. So one thread that is really important to guide the policy is how do we really keep those principles in the focus when you are trying to write the policy or rewrite the policy? You know, this particular back-to-back -back trauma affected everybody, including the board, including the community. When the community feels unsafe, there is a tendency to polarize. People go back to their own attachment figure social ties. And between group attachment disappears or breaks down. So everybody starts looking at each other in a very hostile attribution style, right? Which we are seeing nationally. So in such cases, the risk goes up for suicide or interpersonal violence. 
And when you look at uh, CTC, it really describes suicide, interpersonal violence, community violence are all different types of violence. They are not separate. So they kind of all these, you have to figure out a way to connect the dots and not just have a siloed policy. This is I'm only for suicide prevention. I'm not for domestic violence. I'm not for child abuse. So we really have to quickly learn to start connecting the dots. The second important thing I felt was to keep the focus on that. And the biggest risk was the risk of losing compassion to one group or other group during all these things. That is perhaps the biggest risk as a policy or a school board director or as a physician, we'll have to really keep that perspective. So what I found most helpful was not to react right away because you have 3000 people sharing their emotion and that empathic surge can be very overwhelming. Is to find a way to practice some grounded ac activity as a leader and get my own emotion regulated so I can really calmly look at the bigger picture and then start asking, how do we stay focused on connectedness? Is our policies aligned with that so that Bonnie can do her work, Anav can feel safe and all the students can feel safe. So that was one important uh, thinking that not only me as a school board chair, but my colleagues as the fellow board directors have to keep that perspective throughout. Otherwise, it's very easy to get pulled in one other, other direction and we can lose sight of what it really means to communities of color, disadvantaged community who were historically not doing well. And what all this has done is it has actually made hurt people are hurting more. And that is where we can really guide our thinking based on some principles. But, and think of it like, well, that's what trauma does to all of us. So I don't want to spend too much time, but if any specific question, maybe we can discuss and then I can, maybe we can take one or two examples to illustrate it. Sure. I hope I answered you, Karen. Yeah, no, you did a great job. And I think what you underscored is what we often think about in terms of ACEs science. And that's that one key adult and how much buffering can come from a key relationship during childhood. Um, so I, I appreciate you underscoring that. And for folks who might be on the East Coast or a little bit less familiar with Oregon, they've suffered some tremendous, incredibly large um, wildfires. Wildfire. I want to say violent because they're not just like a fire. They're just incredibly impactful wildfires. So on top of the pandemic and the wildfires and the social isolation, I can't really genuinely imagine I can assume, but I can't truly imagine how that's impacting the community and others. And I'm curious, Denise, if you're seeing um, when, with, the, with our virtual learning and our virtual way of connecting with people, if, if you're seeing anything or if you have some thoughts you want to share around that or something else. Yeah, I think um, what I'm seeing more firsthand is within the adults who are leading um, the students and the, the impact on the adults. I've re I recently asked the nurse group, and tw there's 23 of us that serve Salem-Kaiser, um, to identify their stress levels. And I saw, I saw on a 1 to 10 scale, and I saw a lot of 7 plus kind of numbers, and I, and I feel that and see that amongst the teachers, um, the administration. And I think that's a direct you know, connection to what Dr. Chandragiri was indicating that as leaders, I think we're extra taxed to really take care of ourselves. And, and I, see that, um, I see that it's really easy for some of us to defer to our um, perhaps in, such, in the face of such trauma, defer to our um, coping skills that might be hypervigilance in what we're doing and working even harder or whatever other coping mechanism we may have as individuals and lose that centeredness that Dr. Chandragiri indicated. And, um, and then the kids, of course, uh, are, are impacted directly by that. Yeah. Thank you, Bonnie. That's really important. I appreciate the, um, um, Denise, I'm sorry, the lens around um, the adults within the school setting. We often do put a lot of emphasis or a lot of focus on the youth. And what we are hearing a lot is the difficulty with which the caring professionals in the community, nurses, 
teachers, all of such folks are really having with holding these difficult situations while trying to meet a role that they've never really experienced before. So it's, it's very difficult. Uh, Michael, I'm curious um, if you might be able to share a little bit of your community cafe, community, a community building kind of lens. And um, before you go there, I just hope folks know that um, I think Oregon, maybe it's just my bias, but I think Oregon's pretty unique in the way you've all come together in with authentic relationships with a true shared um, desire to find sources of solutions, path to solutions. And I, I really wanna applaud you for that. And before I forget, I will put into the chat, Michael hosts a community on ACES Connection um, for the uh, Salem, Marion County, Polk County area. And so I'll go ahead and put it, put a link into the chat where um, in the future you guys could re reconnect if you so chose. Thank you. And Michael? Yes, thank you. This is, uh, this is exactly in line with some of the other uh, programs that A Better Normal has put on, talking about consilience within communities and talking about trauma, how do we create a system within a community to address a problem. What I, what I found as a nurse was that I had no idea what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I would make sure that no one died in my care, but there was a point where I realized because someone in my family had sprung on me a number of experiences that he had during high school where he almost died by suicide, I had no idea. Then something happened to my mind and I, the way I approached suicide went from a practice to faces. And when I started seeing faces in my head, suicide prevention took on a different realm. I now wanted to change. I wanted the outcome to be different. I wanted zero suicide. And what I saw in Oregon was that we simply were not approaching that. The numbers of suicide continue to rise. So as I dug into this as a nurse, I like action. And I recognized that the point of care is something that we've been missing. It's the peer it's not necessarily the direct service provider that provides that early identification and rescue behaviors that prevent suicide and then we go to care. And I didn't feel like that lay person, that community member was a full partner. And so my approach was, how do I make that happen? I teach a lot of QPR, which is question, uh, persuade, refer, gatekeep, suicide prevention, gatekeeper training. And then I thought, how can we help these folks, these layperson, a family member, a friend, how can we help them become more able to perform those behaviors and stop suicide? Because that's what we need to do. And so we, I started this, this cafe. The idea was, if we can have a discussion about what are the barriers when you found you had to respond to somebody who was suicidal, what did you run into that prevented you or at least slowed you down? from performing those behaviors. And a couple of things that came up and, and I liked Harnov, you, you're, just, you're just saying all my words. It, it's, it's amazing. What they found was that the resources were fragmented, they were incomplete and no one knew how to find them. The direct service providers might think that there's a system, but, but the people that use the system find that that's not true. So what I see Arnov as is a policy entrepreneur, somebody who saw a gap, and went on his own and that team is approaching it and not waiting for the direct service provider system to fill in the gap. So the cafe was an attempt to bring consilience to the layperson and bring them in as full partners within the community. And that to me is the missing link in suicide prevention strategies to expand the community capacity by empowering the community to be part of this conversation as equals, not as just uh, an affirmative action person on a board, but as equals. Uh, I, I, I think that's the biggest thing. And to me, our community, the foundation for anything that we need to do is has to be based on ACEs science and trauma-informed care so that our community can start healing and then growing. What you just shared, Michael, I think is just spot on. And I really appreciate how each of you holds a part of this whole solution in a really rich and robust way. Um, Alice, I'm curious if we're getting any questions that we'd want to bring to the group. Um, I do see some comments, some folks are sharing resources, and I think um, we really appreciate this opportunity to provide 
um, a venue for this kind of conversation. And I hope that, go ahead. Uh, go, ahead. Mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah, so just to kind of connect the dots, a couple of things that came to my mind when I listened to all of them present. The first step is, if you start looking at the entire community has gone through tr multiple trauma. So think of it like the whole community is going through PTSD in some sense, right? So it has disrupted the attachments. That's why we see people kind of polarizing to whatever they think is their little group. And the intergroup trust is kind of broken down, which affects this connectedness. The second thing, people are all anxious and re-traumatized and reactive and, um, you know, sad. so the pre-existing challenges get heightened. If pre-existing functioning was wonderful, then we'll probably do the same thing. It'll allow us to mitigate what that challenges are there, pre-existing inequities came to the surface. It's almost like the earthquake brought all the fault lines to the surface. So with this, I don't want our group to think, oh, gee, it's doom and gloom. I really want us to start thinking, okay, there are a lot of danger, but what a beautiful opportunity for us to use that perspective and start saying, let's address the real underlying deep uh, inequities whether it's structural inequities, which always existed, or try to look at the intersectionality of all kinds of adversities that affects. It's the same, but different manifestations. Some may be violent, some may be suicidal, some may be overdosing on drugs. The abuse reporting may not be high, but the actual incident may be going up or academic decline or loss of learning. So that's how I'm thinking. So. So keeping that perspective has really helped me. One of the important questions is we need to really be kind to ourselves. So start wear, wearing oxygen mask ourselves before start putting it on others. Whether it's a teacher going through the struggle because teacher is bearing witness now. Vicariously, he or she is getting traumatized. Before it was kids would dress up and show up in classroom and secondhand, they may or may not say, now you're watching right in their bedroom all kinds of uh, real life things are, you know, three hours, four hours, five hours, they're watching it and hearing it and they're probably crying together with the student. The teachers also, the staff also have to go through their own trauma and their own family, but they also have to go through a steep learning curve of switching from real, uh, you know, real time classroom to preparing the lessons this way and then trying to do it what we are doing you know it's not easy to convert that way and you know you can see one frame at a time but in classroom you can see 20 kids at a time right so there are some real face-to-face -face connections are gone so how do you think so we need to be kind to our all of us each of us rather than quick to react just like the startle response in PTSD, there's a startle ap approach to policy making should be avoided. We need to be, we shouldn't be quick at judging and uh, saying you had missed one check mark or you missed one assignment or missed one homework. So keeping that perspective for leaders, managers, supervisors, uh, academic directors or whoever it is. The second important thing is we need to really start building in some universal wellness and calming. So grounding techniques, whether Bonnie's technique has to be scaled up. There is no side effects to belly breathing. Nobody has died in my practice because they were breathing. So maybe everybody can sit and practice, you know, smelling roses and blowing candles. You can start the classroom as when you got your credit hours, start the candle classroom by smelling roses, blowing candles. Then you have a little bit of the instructional time, then end the lecture by smelling roses and blowing candles. Nobody will die because they were breathing. So that is or different types of grounding technique can be taught using all five sensory. For some, it may be touch, somebody else, it may be listening or smell or trying to understand it, incorporate the trauma as an underlying theme in helping and frame the behavior. Don't call it a bad behavior or good behavior. Call it, I said, trauma adaptive behavior. Unfortunately, this adaptation is not working. And then start looking at it from an equity point of view. What tools, instructions, equipment. Don't, don't look beyond the computers because giving a computer alone is meaningless. It is really what message we do and how we 
maybe a certain practice breathing. So really start framing the central issue being the trauma and how trauma leads to variety of adaptation. Some adaptations are successful, some are not. So it also gives us an opportunity to scale up some of what we are discussing. Let's think everybody has gone through ACE unless proven otherwise. You really don't have to sit and do rating. Everybody has been affected. So like, think of it like a universal precaution, what we do before drawing blood. Everybody, you know, you don't ask what is the thing. So I'm just throwing some ideas and hopefully we can bring that into our policy at a community level, school level, director level or home level or individual level. So I want to stop now. Well, I appreciate the universal precautions. It's something that we hear about, but um, just like we used to want to work remotely, but we couldn't figure out how to make it happen. We had COVID and we figured it out. And I think this could also, this scenario could also be a catalyst for really underscoring the importance of a universal precaution. And what that really means is assuming everybody has experienced some sort of childhood trauma and that is impacting their cognition, their reactions, this, their way of being. And in my humble opinion is to uh, support people with, with no, without judgment, to recognize that a lot of folks or most people are having some degree of struggle. And so to assume, not to assume, make assumptions. Um, but uh, I can see in the chat, there's some questions around um Karen I will I'll, oh did you have a specific one you wanted to do no I'm go, go for it okay um I wanted to let um our Keith Howard you had a great question for Arnav and I wanted to um unmute you so you could share your question thank you my question was not even Arnav did a great job of answering so I appreciate that my question is I'm I'm in a rural county we've got two high schools in two school in two separate uh, school districts and two parochial schools. And so how do we how do we reach out and help start a program like that in a in a county like this that has that sort of um, system, you know, we're not one large system is was my point. And uh, Arnoff gave, gave a great answer and I I'd let you give the answer. <laughs> yeah, I, I messaged him in the chat privately. So if you guys are wondering where my response was, that's where it was. But I would love to rephrase it for you guys so that you can all take that into account. Uh, my advice was that um, there are almost certainly uh, people in those school districts who are passionate about this topic, who have gone through this. Um, it, I mean, every community has these people. Um, I myself um, did not even think about starting this company. I was not the one who started this company. So I think the most important step with starting an organization like this is reaching out to the school district as a whole and letting students know that there is a need and kind of introducing their, that idea into their heads. Because as I mentioned, there are students who have that kind of inclination and they have that initiative and they just need the, the, you know, the, the impetus to take it. I think that's the most important step is letting students know that there is a need. And then the other thing I mentioned was um, for us at least the most difficult part of this was the technical like nitty gritties of running a business because we are a nonprofit organization and that means we have to like file taxes a certain way. We have to have a bylaws and all of this. And, and that's um, that, that technical stuff is a challenge that we've had to overcome. And so um, before you even start recruiting students uh, to do that, that's one thing to consider is to help them help guide them through that process and then they can just focus on the the perspective side of things and having that discussion um, and kind of keeping the discussion to them and then helping them with getting started and um, incorporating themselves so i hope that answers the question but uh, that was my advice for that and while we're, while i'm still talking uh, there was another question for me specifically um, about what students are feeling right now with all the all the crises going on and I, I just wanted to quickly go over that um, the general consensus that I've seen from my community and my peers is um, there are pros and cons to this of course um, this I mean the whole this whole this whole thing is is hard for people there's also benefits um, but for the most part the hardest thing about this is that this is school and 
we are in school and this is all the hard parts of school, you know, with, with all the studying and tests and grades and all of that. But we also are missing the, the fun parts of school. Um, the, part, the parts where we get to hang out with friends, where we get to talk to each other, those connections that we were talking about earlier, um, that those connections with each other, we're missing that. So it's school with all the hard parts, but without the, hard, without the fun parts. So that's how we're feeling right now. And that's, that's just from COVID alone. So the other stressors are affecting other people disproportionately. Not, the stressors aren't all affecting everyone equally. In Salem, there wasn't uh, that much effect from the fire. When it was happening with the smoke, um, it was hard to go outside, which did take away um, a lot of students' coping mechanisms because a lot of people uh, go outside, do outdoor activities to deal with their stress. Um, but that, um, again, that affects some people more than others. Some people had to evacuate from their homes, which was really hard uh, to try to balance school with that. And then some, uh, some, some people in, in uh, a little bit farther out from Salem actually had their homes burned down. So that's, uh, that, so again, just like different parts of the communities feel different things. And as part of, as part of our effort to kind of do that, as I mentioned, I'm a co-president of our Live to Tell's chapter at our school. So um, one thing that we're trying to do is send out a survey to our students uh, to just kind of gauge that and what, what those stresses are and uh, how we can deal with them, what kind of resources they would like to see. So um, that, I guess that is a long way of saying that in general, people are feeling that their that lack of connection is hard. Even though we do have texting and FaceTime, it's, it's hard to go without seeing that. And the other stressors kind of affect different parts of the communities differently. And so kind of gauging, uh, gauging is important, like sending out a... Thank you, Arnav. I totally appreciate. I appreciate the folks who are asking the questions and that you can bring a lens that um, the rest of I, I myself could not replicate in any way. So that's really great. I can see that um, we I just want to do a little time check. We have about uh, seven or eight more minutes and I want to make sure we get to any questions that might be uh, pending. Or if the guests, if anybody on the panel has a message, a, a, a thought you really want to share, please, please speak up and do so. Um, Allison, do we have questions that are pending or? Mm -hmm. I um, would love to hear from um, Amanda about Challenge Day. Um, so let me find. Hi all, thanks for the conversation today. A topic near and dear to my heart as I lost a loved one to suicide about 13 years ago, a boyfriend, and then recently lost a nephew to suicide during the pandemic. And so I'm reminded of the work I did in my own healing um, and then, you know, moving towards suicide prevention work. Also worked with AFS AFSP here in NorCal, but started volunteering with Challenge Day who um, I saw on Oprah years ago. Um, they do incredible work. They use, um, I call them adult teenagers, like adults who have that real connection with the teen community who have obviously um, suffered some sort of ACE um, event in their history and they lead with that story and with their resilience and what you know, that's not where they dive in initially in the day long work that they do when they come into high schools, but that is like really their superpower and they really teach that to the teenage kids. It's a series of ups and downs. It's fun. It really, um, it requires adult facilitators from the community to um, donate their time to help with the day. And for me, what was so profound was <clears throat> getting at, at a certain point in the day, once the kids have felt safe, um, we get into small groups, we sit in a circle in chairs, our knees are touching, we're connected and the kids feel connected to us as leaders and to their fellow students. And we really drop, they call it dropping the water line and basically going to the feelings, you know, where the iceberg is underneath the water line and really sharing what's going on. And um, that's when the kids start sharing about the cutting and the suicide attempts and all those things that they never were able to share with anyone. And then we are referring that to the school nurses and the social workers by the end of the day. So that's a really quick recap. You can check it out. I just love their work. They've been around for 30 plus years and um, really, really effective work, work once we get back 
to schools being on site, um, especially after this pandemic, I think it'd be a really wonderful way to bring school communities and kids back together and reconnect. Thanks for letting me share. Amanda, I'm curious. Um, so I just want to, I put a little note in the chat. I think what you're sharing is really valuable. And I'm so grateful that we can share it in this format. I just want to let folks know that if you have a similar idea or um, something you want to share, please consider sharing it on our networked platform, um, ACES Connection. I have the uh, link there. You have to join. And the reason being, we want to be a very safe community where people can come and have these tender conversations in a way that feels safe. So um, no pressure to do so, but if you're so inclined, um, we do find that when folks share, it's, it, it's like dropping that little pebble in the water. The ripple is quite wide and um, a lot of goodness can come from that. So I appreciate your story. I'm very sorry to hear about your, your loved ones um, and the difficulty too. I, I do appreciate you bringing this forward. Yeah. So we're going to be coming up towards the end. Um, Allison, do you have some thoughts or does anybody want to have some wrap up ideas or? Yeah, let's do Karen. Um, so we had so many wonderful comments and resources and questions in the chat. And I just want to thank everyone for sharing those. We won't have time to address more of those, but I just want to say I, I read them all and they're so, um, I feel enriched having read them. So I just want to say thank you to everyone. Um, and uh, I, I really wish we could uh, keep having the conversation with literally everyone's comments. Um, I would love, Karen, if you wanted to go around to some of the, um, um, uh, panelists and just ask for just a couple, um, just a couple sentences each to wrap up and then we'll, yeah. That would be great. Thank you. Um, and Allison will have some instructions for us right before we all log off to around saving the chat and those resources. Yeah. So um, maybe we'll do as we did in the beginning and kind of do a round robin. Maybe, um, Michael, do you want to start with a few, uh, a few thoughts, a few, well, a few sentences, a couple sentences? Thank you. Sure. My big thought is that there are so many great programs. I don't know them all. One of the problems is that how do you how do you get in touch with that? So I think um, in our community, one lack is a connective umbrella for the whole community. There's this great organization, this great effort, these resources, but there's not an overreaching umbrella function. And I think using a model that's been in place, like the self-healing model, allows each of these entities to self organize and continue onward. However, it creates a framework so we're all pushing in the same direction. And I think our fragmented system is, is causing problems simply not because of the good work, but because they're not connected. As we mentioned before, relationships and interconnectivity is the magic. Mm -hmm. oh, that's, those are really good points. And I'd like to just scaffold, if I could, very briefly, that in California, our Surgeon General, as you might know, is Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. And through her work, her ACEs Aware initiative, um, screening, the next step is to those community-based resources. And so they're in the process of developing models for a network of care. So I think what you just described, Michael, is something we hope at some point to be more of the norm instead of the, the dream. So yeah, thank you. If you wanna go ahead and pass the, pass the mic, so to speak. Sure, I'll pass to Dr. Chandigiri. Well, thank you very much, you know, uh, recognizing that not only we have to push the car in the same direction, but uh, this also, you know, the trauma occurs in relationship concept, context. Healing also can occur in relationship context. So each, all of us have power within us to ensure the adversities don't keep on going from generation to generation or between us. We all have the power to interrupt that. And if we don't, we have done nothing. So go home, let's ask ourselves, what can I do within my sphere of influence to interrupt that? And uh, that's one model to take care of generational trauma, historical trauma, and also uh, what's going on in the current. Thank you. Bonnie, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Just to piggyback a little bit on what Michael was saying with referral resources, um, I know about 20 years ago in Los Angeles, I was uh, looking for um, a youth 
group that dealt with children or young adults that um, were attempting suicide or had thoughts and came up with nothing. And it was very frustrating. And we've come a long way, but not long and far enough. And I really would love to see a resource uh, book or a reference book where you can pull it out at school, at work, wherever to help that person right then and there and say, instead of saying, I'm gonna get back to you. And maybe it's a week or two and that's too much time gone by. So um, yeah, I like to see some power and energy going towards a group reference book. Thanks. Awesome. It sounds like Arnoff is working on something that you're kind of conceptualizing. This is really nice. And uh, Denise, did you want to offer a few a few words? I see the clock. I'm really grateful. I think that uh, to to be here and to make these connections between the good work that are happening happening within each one of us in our place in the world, and I mean a testament of uh, the importance of a connection like this is that I'm in the same building with Arnav and didn't know him. So hi Arnav. <laughs> I mean, this is a beautiful connection. So I really, um, I really appreciate these the, this community for that. So thank you. Oh, thank you. That's that's wonderful. Great story. And Arnoff, do you have a couple last words, or um, we're right up against the clock, so we're just kind of winding up. Gonna... Mm -hmm. Just going to echo um, what's been said already. It's really important to bridge the gap in the community, kind of bring everything together. And then also to just work. I mean, again, this is great having this conversation throughout the community and just working on it because a lot of people feel that this is an issue, but working on it and taking action is, is, is um, yeah. the thing that we need to work on. So that's, that's all I have to say. Well, I appreciate each person, each of you and all of our uh, participants in really bringing um, a, a lens to this issue around um, suicide, prevention, awareness, recovery. So thank you all for your time today. And uh, for our panelists, I would like to do a round of applause and thank you to Allison for technically getting us through lots of bumps um, with, with, with grace. So thank you to everybody. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you all. And I hope that you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you to all the panelists today. I learned so much. I really um, feel very inspired by your work. Thank you so much. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Thank you all.